and I just fell to the floor. My wife's like, oh my God, are you all right? And she ran over. And I remember for the first time feeling her embrace as this present moment human. It's saying that way through is to go within. And really at the end of the day, like, I mean, all of this is really about going within. The only way out is in. And that I love. The only way out of what you're currently experiencing to the other side is through the shit, not the detour, not the distraction, not working more or making more money or, you know, betting on sports or gambling or getting a girlfriend. None of that shit's going to solve. It will distract and just prolong the amount of suffering that you're in. All right, Ian Lobos, uh, welcome to the Soul Seeker Podcast. I'm so stoked you're here. You and I have connected a couple months ago when you were building the brand Men on Purpose, and now you're truly building from ground up in a rebrand, the irreplaceable man. So I'm so stoked to talk with you about men's work, plant medicine ceremonies, and most of all, integration, because without actually integrating these experiences, what's the point? Ian, welcome to the pod. Thanks, man. Appreciate you having me. Yeah, absolutely. So let's start with your journey because you and I have talked a fair amount about men's work and business and things like that. I've been on your podcast, but I didn't actually realize it till we were just talking a little bit before we hit record that you've danced with quite a bit of medicines, everything from ayahuasca to combo and integrating with mushrooms and all the things. So how did this journey of working with psychedelics in a more ceremonial approach start for you? Well, I think it goes way back. Um, I, I, I think like a lot of us, we, we were taught that drugs are bad or that drugs are recreational and they're just meant to kind of check you out of your current situation. And, um, and there was never really this, you know, mindset around plants being medicine. And the more that I was having challenges in my marriage in like 2015, 2016, like my business was doing really well. My marriage was really crumbling. And the advice that I was getting at that time was you need more compassion. You need to feel more. You need to understand your wife more, like be really with her and not just like in a room where she's talking. And I just, I, I just couldn't get that at that time. And I was facing a divorce and which we didn't end up getting divorced, which is awesome. And this is really where the irreplaceable man part of my life came in. I just didn't know it until most recently. And I was in danger of being replaced by my wife because I wasn't the husband that she needed me to be. I wasn't there for her. And so my plant medicine journey starts really the following year when I started to get these downloads. Like I'm telling you, one day my entire YouTube, like home, like a homepage, it was loaded with ayahuasca stuff. And I never really understood. The only place I'd ever heard about ayahuasca was from Robin Quivers on the Howard Stern show. Uh -huh. she, she came back and told Howard about her ayahuasca experience. That's the only time I'd ever heard about it. And now it's on my YouTube. And then I get a call from this, this incredible person that I knew, um, Rhonda, who I was, I was working with, or just kind of met and had started working with. And she said, hey, I think grandmother's mother spirit is calling you. And I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? And as I started to understand it more and I just said yes to the journey, these things started opening up for me. And I don't know, man, I, I, there's so many places I can go with this story. Like it was one of the scariest times of my life leading up to my first ayahuasca experience because I'd never done a hallucinogen in my life. All I knew was that I wanted to get farther faster and I was really having so much trouble digging in and diving in deep to my psyche, to my traumas and the reason why I couldn't get really deeply connected with my wife. And I knew that plant medicine would help me. It was just so scary to let go of control and to like surrender to that and to not know what I was about to experience from this you know, this, this, this thing that I never heard of in my life, except for a month before that, you know, and the journey really begins there of, of self-discovery at a, a much deeper level than I'd ever experienced connection with 
myself and my wife that I never experienced and, and tapping into places in me that I'm not sure if I could have tapped into like in the next decade without plant medicine, you know? And I think there's still some people that listen to me talk about it and they go, yeah, well, like, you know, you had, you had to take drugs or they kind of have that old world thinking. And I don't, I don't know if I'd be where I am today without plant medicine, you know, and other stuff that I use like breath work and meditation. I just don't think that I'd be the husband and father that I am today and the man I am today without it. I mean, forget about the business stuff. I don't think I'd be the same human. Right. And that's what's most important. And the whole drug conversation, like we can just throw that out the window yeah. because all the listeners here are so far past that. And I mean, you know, for someone to still make that argument, like it's just straight ignorance because yeah. you don't know anything. I mean, it's one thing that, let me complete that sentence. You don't know anything about ayahuasca itself. If you're calling it drugs, not that you don't know anything. Right. Um, What's interesting is right now I'm in the middle of a launch for a ketamine program where I've partnered with a ketamine clinic that's doing by the book, 100% legal. And my role in that is doing the integration with our structured flow integration program. And ketamine has been so profound for me in working with it in a therapeutic ceremonial approach in a way. Yeah. But I will say, like, Ketamine is more of a quote unquote drug. We can't make that argument that ketamine is a plant medicine. Sure. Of course, we can zoom out and be like, well, everything is from the earth and whatever you use, right? But I'm not going to go there. Um, just saying ayahuasca, though, is a drug that's just straight ignorance at this point, which that's sure. fine. You know, if you want to believe that, that's, that's cool. But um, it is a mix of multiple plants and shamans were literally told, I mean, this is the story, this is a legend, but they were told in a vision to mix these two different plants, thousands in a jungle. Like, yeah, dude, that's the part that I find so fascinating is, is you, these two random, right? It's not like they grow. It's not like the flower of the vine or the flower of the plant. You mix them this part and this part together and mash it up and do this. That's the part that actually really is fascinating. Mm. How they understood that those two things go together to create this. It's really awesome. Yeah. And I mean, 5-MeO DMT, Bufo Alvarius is something that I'm very familiar with and I've worked closely in my life. And that's another one where you get you you mindfully sing to the toads, right? The Siri tribe in the storm desert of Mexico, they sing to the toads and bring out the toads. And then they take a little bit of the venom, not too much. So they have it for themselves and then they crystallize it and then you smoke it. And that like, of course, when you say it that way, it sounds a little like weird, right? Crackety, but yeah. Especially like tribes in Mexico, like crystallize and do what, huh? And I have a friend who went down there with the Siri tribe to learn from them directly. And she came back and told me that they told them the star people, meaning ETs, told them yeah. this. So it's so interesting to hear the different origins of these medicines. But going back to your story with ayahuasca and kind of being at that low of lows, I can relate to that when I first sat with ayahuasca as well. I'm curious what integration looked like for you because you you and I have connected on this. We're similar in a lot of ways. Yeah. At the time when I was integrating, I would jokingly call myself a recovering bro. I didn't know anything about spirituality. I didn't even know about archangels, tarot cards, oral oracle cards, the differences, like all the things, you name it, crystals, any of it at all. And now like I'm all about all of it, right? Years later. But I'm curious for you not just like the different things that come with spirituality, but just making sense of this human experience from a grounded 3D perspective. What did that integration look like for you? Hmm. You know, when I, when I left the ceremony, um, what's interesting is I was watching the show on Netflix uh, called How to, oh my God, How to, uh, Train your brain. No, how do you know what I'm talking about? The like the four. Oh yeah, the Michael Pollan one. Yeah. Um, my God, how to change your brain? Yeah, how to change your mind or something. Something like that. Yeah. I don't know why I'm blanking on it. And I'm watching the last one, 
in the series and I realized that where they're filming with like the congresswoman and the and the other like government officials, that's where I did my first ceremony. Oh wow. And I was like, whoa, that's weird. That's really weird. So anyway, I leave there. I rent a car. My wife was gonna meet me in LA. I drive down the coast, no food, just water. And I just like camp out on the beach and just like I'm in a real, it's just in a real like blowy, just just don't want to talk to anybody, don't want to be social, don't want to see anybody, don't want to hear anything. I just want to be like just quiet and just process. And so I I finished that journey, came back down, integrated into Los Angeles. I didn't live here at the time. I lived in Baltimore. We were out here for like a real estate convention. And my wife and I went to the real estate convention, probably two hours in, I was like, not for me anymore. This isn't for me anymore. I had already been running my coaching business. That's what I knew my calling was. And I think it was about a month later that I was walking through my house and I just like started like welling up with tears. And um, ordinarily, I would have like run from that. I would have avoided it. I would have like gone out to my car and cried. So I didn't want my, my wife to see that. Except this time with the help of the medicine, it was so weird. It was just like the voice just said, you're not going anywhere. And my knees like gave out and I literally could not get up. And I just fell to the floor. My wife's like, oh my God, are you all right? And she ran over. And I remember for the first time, like, feeling her embrace as this present moment human, not as a like, all right, well, hey, like I got shit to do. Let's hug, hug, hug. Okay, see you later. I just was there and I was crying hysterically. And now her parents are knocking on the door and I'm like, I don't know what's going on with my life. I feel like my fucking world's falling apart. Like, oh my God, what the fuck is going on with me? I can't stop crying. And so the integration for me was just shedding all this emotional stuff that was pent up in me that I was using money and success to hide from. And my integration was crucial. Like my wife was crucial in my integration. I was talking to her every night. I was telling her about what I was envisioning. What was really weird though, is that when I came back, everything was fine. And two days back to my house is when the real work began. I got a, t a fever of 102 degrees and it lasted for 10 days straight. I was hallucinating every night. It was like the medicine said, we're not done with you. And because I'll be honest, the ceremony was, was pretty simple on me. I didn't throw up at all, not even on combo. There was no throwing up. There was no purge. I was so holding on to control for so like dear life. My ego just didn't want to let it go. So when I got home and I got into my comfy bed in my room, it hit me so freaking hard. And I remember waking up in the middle of the night, like, I remember my, my vision, this hallucination was that my wife left me and I was so scared that like, I reached out to her and I grabbed her and she's like, you're all right. I'm like, no, I got to talk to you. Like, and I said to her, I now understand the, the implications and the results of my choices in you. Because what I saw inside this like hallucination was, was her standing in front of me, me stepping out of my body, turning around, like morphing into her and like, and, and the medicine saying, do you want to know the result of your choices in others? And I said, yes. And then it just like turned bright red. And I remember, I still can feel that feeling where I felt like we were disconnected and she was gone and I never wanted that. Right. And so all the business stuff that I do, all the men's coaching, it all stemmed from the time when we weren't going to be together and, and all these things that I had to figure out to get deeper level connection with her. So the integration for me was actually very challenging. Uh, 10 days of 102 degree fever, some days spike into 103, 104, like it was scary. And the people that I was counting on for advice at that time were like, stay with it. You got to be in this thing. Right before I drank the medicine, the shaman said to me, I know you're scared. The only way out is through. And that's probably the best piece of advice that I give to people who are doing plant medicine journeys is you just got to go through it. It's going to be scary. It might suck. 
your journey is going to be your journey. The only way out of what you're currently experiencing to the other side is through the shit, not the detour, not the distraction, not working more or making more money or, you know, betting on sports or gambling or getting a girlfriend. None of that shit's going to solve. It will distract and just prolong the amount of suffering that you're in. And so it was another, the only way out is through, and you're going to go through this for another 10 days. And, you know, you're going to get real connected with your wife, which we did. My daughter was, uh, my daughter was like two years old at that time. And I think, I think there's a, there's a, there's a really good part of me that says doing the plant medicine when I did and the connections that I experienced with my wife and with other people, because I was so much more open, like it saved relationships, it saved my marriage, it saved relationships. I'm not saying ayahuasca saved my marriage. I'm saying that I was able to get more open and vulnerable with her, which allowed her to trust me more and understand the real me, not just this egoed facade, power hungry, money hungry guy that I was, you know, running around like. And um, yeah, man, it was a weird, I haven't thought about that in quite a while. That's what my integration was like. It was a roller coaster. And I've never heard anybody like say that. They're usually their integration is like pretty simple, but their ceremony was crazy. My ceremony was simple and my integration was huh. crazy. Interesting. Yeah. 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 I mean, I can't think of anyone I've spoken with that had to deal with like a 102 degree fever for 10 days or any any sort of thing like that specifically. But I do feel like integration you know everyone's is different for sure but it's never easy you mm -hmm. know and if it's easy then i think saying it's easy is bypassing actually doing the work and going back to the way that things have always been because that's the reason why we go into these medicine spaces to yeah. dive into the depths of our psyche and as you put it the only way out is through and i recent recently heard someone say the only way out is in and that I love, like, obviously I love that the only way out is through and it's basically saying the same thing, but it's saying that way through is to go within. And really at the end of the day, like, I mean, all of this is really about going within. So right. thank you so much for sharing your story. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. After those 10 days, I imagine there was quite some time of, you know, figuring things out with your emotional state and everything else. What did the next few months look like? That was, um, I was like January of 2018. And so by the way, let me give you a little bit more context. <clears throat> the end of 2016 was when my wife and I were really like, this, I don't know how to make this thing work anymore with you. I like, guess what my wife was saying. And then beginning of like end of 2016 early 2017 i started a, a personal development journey that was like massively obsessive and, and intense and so by the end of that 2017 journey that's when ayahuasca called me and said there's only so much you can do on your own right that's really what it was saying you can go through 700 hours this this past year but there's only still only so much that we can that you're going to be able to do on your own and so i feel like it called me in um by May, I had kind of officially launched and, and started my, my official coaching business. Even though I was coaching before that, I had really said, okay, this is, this is where I need to be. I need to be leading people. I need to be coaching. Being a real estate agent wasn't for me. It just was providing an income. And I really liked the people that I worked with, like most of the clients. And so... I, I really began that coaching journey and it was scary and it was crazy. And I, and I started building exercises that I knew had helped me and I started building them for the general public. So I don't, I don't, it, it wasn't like a, it just kind of like after that 10th day, it just lifted like, like nothing had happened. It was really strange. I woke up and I remember feeling completely normal. Like I wasn't cold. I wasn't uh, shaking. I wasn't sweating it was just, I was back to normal. It was, everything was fine. I got up I went into my office and I, you know, started making some calls again. And then I realized like, okay, the game has changed. You need to, you need to pursue this coaching thing for sure. And you need to start letting real estate go. 
So I started making moves to build more passive income so that my coaching business could be my main and my real estate business could go away and I could like use real estate to build passive income. And it, it, it worked and it didn't work. I mean, I like, it's all I do today is coach. So it worked and it didn't work because I made some errors in judgment in my real estate investing world. And I made some great moves and I made some not great moves. And, you know, I think that's everybody's story in real estate investing. So I have a question for you because one of the main constants between like these spiritual awakening stories is a career transition. Now being that you are about five years removed from this experience, uh, that's a long time. Congratulations, mm -hmm. by the way. That's awesome. Nice. What would be your advice for someone that is recently integrating a medicine ceremony or just something going on in their life and they're wanting to make that massive career transition because what they're doing no longer aligns with them? What would be the advice you would give that person? Hmm. I, it really depends on how long they've been thinking that, right? If they just started getting aware of, man, this isn't for me, I, I don't want to do this then I would say, just give it a little bit of time, gather data, and then make your move, like pick a date to make your move, you know, give yourself like six months, gather data, and then, you know, make your move at that point. For somebody like me, who was constantly thinking about how much I was misaligned with what I was doing for a living, um, I knew I was ready right away. I also, I also had a little bit to kind of, I guess, fall back on is not the right word. So here's the thing, the the authentic me was ready to make a shift and go for it at that time. If I could take a time machine back, I would have wrapped my real estate business, sold every property that I had and funded my coaching business in a really proper way. Looking back on it though, that would have never worked because I wasn't the person that I am today. And going through all the things that I went through, I, I became the coach that I am today. I became the husband and irreplaceable man that I am today. It's the only reason I can run the business that, that I do and help the way that I help. So I think there's a there's a, a strategy that you have if it's like this vision comes to you and you're like, oh my God, I gotta change industries. I gotta move to Bali and I'm, I'm going. If you have nothing going on, if you have no significant other, you're in an apartment, you got no ties to the city you live in, no kids, roll, right? And you're young enough, roll. It, I had a business with employees and a wife and a, and a little baby at home and, I, I couldn't just roll out like that. Um, that's why I knew that the shift was needed and I just took some time to gather information and then, you know, made the move in May. And there's other people that just don't trust themselves enough to ever make the move, which, you know, there's, there's something to be said there too. Yeah. I think you make a great point. It's the same advice I give to, you know, continue like explore the side hustle, whatever it is, build that up versus just like completely go cold turkey and, you know, start from scratch. I think it's important to at least get some momentum. I well, know you, what's that? Well, there, there, the, the thing is just because the medicine showed you this piece mm. doesn't mean that you are now the human that can operate that machinery, right? So there is a still a personal growth journey that you must, you must like align into where your spirit and and psyche and your inner being has gone the early like the authentic you you still have to eliminate that's why i came up with um this formula illuminate eliminate calibrate equals acceleration i was so tired of hustling and grinding so i i thought okay how much more do i need to illuminate here great now i'll start working on the elimination phase then i'll start working on the calibration phase and the momentum will just happen so i I, there is that piece of advice that I give everybody, which is, are you actually the person that can execute the operation the way that you see it going down? And the answer usually is no. You need to now become that person. So having that vision, having that time frame, understanding who you need to become, it helps you get structured to your personal growth journey that you're still in charge of. And you can become that person by eliminating the pieces that are no longer you and become the person that can actually execute on this plan that you have or this move or this business idea in, you know, whatever, six months or a year, I think that's really crucial to pay attention to. Just because you go to an ayahuasca ceremony and see some shit that you've never seen, you're like, I'm so motivated to uproot my family and move to Ecuador. And, you know, you're like, well, I mean, you do have to have a little bit of responsibility in there. Unless yeah. your family's like, let's roll, let's go. 
my wife was not like that because I wasn't a person that could be trusted at that time. I was kind of this visionary that was like all over the place and emotionally unstable. And I needed to become a person that she could trust. And then she started making moves with me. Yeah. Thank you for saying that because I think a lot of people don't want to sit in the discomfort. And I know that's something that I did for several years and not knowing and just surrendering almost like, you know what, Michael Singer's second book is all about the surrender experiment. Right. My own version of just how deep and how deep can I surrender? And none of this is making sense right now. I'm hurting financially big time, very uncomfortable and barely making it work but I'm going to have this faith. And now I'm on the other side of that being like, oh, I see it now. So clearly I had to do all those things, whether it was my yoga teacher training, my men's work, or those just sitting in discomfort when I knew I had to felt like I had to be building something and me being my human design manifester, me being someone that's produced 10 podcasts, wrote three books at the time, now four, and just multiple businesses, all the things being like sitting in that silence. It's very uncomfortable, but you are so right that we need the time, whether whatever, everyone's journey is going to be different, but thank you for bringing that up as well. Yeah, of course. Transition to men's work. How did you become like, obviously, I guess uh, your coaching business, um, was it specifically for men at that time when you no. were building it in 2018. Yeah. So talk to us about how you became so passionate about men's work specifically and, and what men's work means to you. I mean, it was all men's, it was all men at that time, only because all, a lot of the groups that I was in were all men. And, um, and I was like, like whatever, not lead generating, you know what I mean? Like prospecting in those groups and they were just coming to me for advice. And, and, um, you know, I, I don't think it was until, I don't think it was until 2020 that I really realized it was men's work that I needed to do and help men become that more on purpose and irreplaceable version of them so they can impact the world at whatever capacity they're supposed to, you know, aligning with their purpose and their mission, focusing on what the mission of their relationship with themselves and their marriages and, and like finding alignment in their life and balance and checking the ego and dealing with, you know, past traumas and healing those things and, and solidifying relationships. Like I knew all these things. I just wasn't the guy that could, that could live it as congruently. And so I, I had to, even, even like today, I'm still on the journey to, to evolving me into that man, constant, constant journey. So men's work for me, isn't just men's personal growth and development. It's, it's, like why I'm sh- I'm shifting the brand. Like in 2020, I was speaking at a podcast convention for a real estate podcast that I was co-hosting. I was actually hosting for a friend of mine. And all I cared about was like the growth of the human. I was just fascinated with the growth of the human in their business or for their business and how their business changed when they grew, right? Business grows to the extent that you do. Life grows to the extent that you do. That's what I was fascinated by. And so... I'm at this podcast convention or this thing, and this lady comes up to me and says, hey, I think you'd be really perfect for my Men on Purpose podcast. And I was like, oh, okay. She goes, I don't mean to be a guest. I mean to buy it. And her exact words were, I'm going to mothball it. It's going nowhere. Like, I'm going to mothball it if you don't buy it. And I said, okay, uh, let me call my wife. And I looked at all the, the, the journaling that I was doing and vision casting and Men on Purpose was all over the place. And I bought the podcast and it, I mean, it didn't have anything to it. It had 160 episodes. They were of no substance. They were basically like a, you know, canned interview questions. They, they, they really didn't have any depth. I thought, man, I can really add some value here and go back to some of these guests, bring them back on and talk as another fellow man with them about the shit that men are really struggling with or really dealing with in these different areas of life. And so that's when the men's focus was born. And that I really felt like I had aligned with my purpose and my mission, which was to guide men into becoming more on purpose with their lives and their relationships with themselves and their wives and their kids and their businesses and their community, their money. And over the last three years, I've 
I built the Men on Purpose podcast. We're at like episode 301, which you've been on. Well, actually, I think you're this week. I think so. Yeah, actually. Yeah, yeah. you're episode 301, ironically. Um, and then I got another download. I was I just got another download about a month ago that was like, it's not tight enough. It's it's not growing the way you want it to because it's not tight enough. You're not calling in the men who you used to be. And it's not that you weren't on purpose. It's that you were replaceable. And so six months ago, I came up with the irreplaceable man. However, I wasn't an irreplaceable man at that point in my mind. I had some more growing to do. So again, I didn't take that leap. I trademarked irreplaceable man and I got the dot com and then I left it alone and I kept running men on purpose and I tried and tested a bunch of new stuff and I built all these cool programs and and then the day came at the end of January where I was at a really powerful mastermind with the guy that's on episode 300 Keith Yaki and he questioned me about my mission and about my purpose and I was not as clear as I wanted to be and what was really clear was when I went through this journey with my wife, what changed me and what what shifted my focus of like my mission of my life was to become this irreplaceable husband that my wife never wanted to leave and to become this irreplaceable man and leader and son and father that could never be replaced because I'm the most authentic me and you can't clone that. You can't, can't match that because you're not me. DNA wise, you're not me. And so that's the journey that I've always been on. I just wasn't the guy that could see it that clearly. I became the guy that could see it that clearly. And I called my team and, and I said, hey, we're going to pivot. We have to pivot now. So on Monday, which would be like the, I don't know, the 20th or something of, uh, February, of fe February, we will launch. It's not, it's not a relaunch. It's just a brand change. And then it's a, it's a focus. Like we're talking about really tighter stuff. My wife and I will be talking about the irreplaceable man and like all the stuff that we've morphed into. The thing is though, I think if I would have hopped into that and just like jumped in right away, seven, six months ago, I couldn't have run that efficiently. I, I just wasn't at that point in my life to see that as clearly. It was still a little bit of like coloring to my lens that I see my life in. Today, it's very clear. Everybody that I tell about, you know, this change that we're making is like, oh, fuck, dude, that's... That's so powerful. That's so clear. Irreplaceable man. I get it. I know exactly what you do and exactly who you help. I know exactly how you're helping men. And it's exciting, right? It's super exciting for us to be in this new phase with this, what I thought mental purpose I was going to run forever. Honestly, like I thought it was going to be my, there was going to be a mental purpose logo on my casket and mm -hmm. all like my gravestone. And it was a little hard to, um, to move from the brand because I identified with the brand so well. And I, and it, I really built something very special for the men of the world. And I know that it's not what it was designed for. It's designed to carry me only so far. And now irreplaceable man is like the ship that we're going to sail on. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. It's huge. That's Thanks amazing you. and exciting. And I'm someone who loves branding. So that's always fun, even yeah. though it can be a little bit stressful, but yeah, I think a, a good takeaway from that, thank you again for sharing, is just knowing when the time is right, because it's kind of like you said earlier in what we were talking about it, with these career transitions, rebrand, relaunch, whatever it is, like we can get caught up in this idea and then use the masculine energy to just make it happen because we can do that. We're humans, right? Sure. We're human doings. But I think it's more important to sit with it, let it marinate, let it unfold naturally just like you did and that is amazing to follow up on everything about the irreplaceable man my question for you is the men that are coming to you like obviously this is new that's irreplaceable man but you came up with the brand based off of the men that are coming to you and where you were previously what is it about them that is replaceable sure well, they, they're processing themselves and, and identifying themselves as a provider and a protector. And that's replaceable. Your wife doesn't just need a protector and a provider. And I'm speaking from this place of, I, I, I was that guy. I thought, well, I'm bringing home a ton of money and like the house is safe and everybody's cool. So why am I getting shit? Why do I have to do dishes? Why am I like, 
why are you pissed off at me? Why can't we, you know, why can't we have sex every day? Why can't we do this? Why are you upset this time and not? And it was just this really vicious cycle. And what I find is a lot of the men who are in power in their professional world are having a lot of trouble and challenge and struggle in their personal world, especially in their marriage. And they're unable to transfer those skills and talents over from what makes them successful professionally over into the personal. And therefore, they're replaceable in that personal world. They're also replaceable in the professional world too, because they're probably just a carbon copy of somebody else, some book they read or some mentor that they're, they're you know, trying to be like. And a lot of these guys are facing this stress and this challenge every day, and they're going for all of the escape tactics. I think you and I talked about that on my podcast. They're avoiding and avoiding and escaping and coping instead of sitting and facing and understanding what they need to do and who they need to become for their wives. And so the replaceable man is the guy that runs, escapes, and blames, right? And the irreplaceable man is the guy who sits still and focuses and turns and faces the monster. You know what I mean? Yeah, well said. And um, I'm going to write that down, actually, so I can give that to my team. <laughs> Um, and I just, I've never said it exactly like that. So I, I like the way it came out and, uh, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna make sure they know about it. Um, and what's interesting is when you turn and face the monster and you start dealing with your shit, I think the scary part for most men is how, how do I do it? What do I do? When do I do it? How long do I have to sit and face the monster that I've been running from for 40 years or 35 years? And what I tell them is, look, what I built for myself is a structure and a strategy and a system to follow that's proven and measurable. I can give that same thing to you. That's why I built the men's work, the men's coaching company, because I wanted to share that with more men to not have them have to experience the pain that I felt of, man, my wife's going to leave. And I don't, I thought I was doing everything right. So now when you turn and you face it and you can work yourself through this proven and measurable, quantifiable system and structure and you got the support of other dudes who are high level like you and also experiencing a wife who's completely unhappy and you don't understand why like you can you can go a lot farther a lot faster in that in that capacity in that in that context and so these guys are you know the guys that i help are guys that go i know something needs to change i'm not i can't keep running i can't throw money at it anymore i can't escape it I don't want my family to go. I just don't know what to do. And so when they can put their ego down for a second and say, I just, I don't know what to do, but I know that guy does. So I'm going to ask him and I'm going to join that program and I'm going to get support and systems and structure to work with. That's the type of guy that we work with. Not the guy that's like, ah, fucking man, I'll just, I'll get divorced. It is what it is. I'll give up half my money. And look, there are plenty of relationships that are not savable out there because both parties won't work on themselves. What I'm telling you is you want to become irreplaceable in your marriage and in your relationships. It does not matter if your marriage can't be saved. When you become an irreplaceable man, you become an irreplaceable man in the next relationship. And if you have kids and your marriage doesn't work, you become an irreplaceable partner to your ex-wife and father to your children, who's a better model of what relationship means and communication and togetherness and bond. The irreplaceable man doesn't mean just saving your marriage. It means saving you from this inauthentic guy that you've been running around thinking that like just throwing some money at shit and providing at a high level is going to actually help you. Totally. Yeah, no, all that makes sense. And uh, yeah, nothing more there. The last topic I have for you is around daily and weekly practices as it relates to mindfulness and spirituality. Similar to you, I'm doing more of a soft, uh, not really a rebrand, but every couple of years I changed the tagline and Soul Seeker it was initially a journey of self-discovery. Then two years later, it was a journey of self-discovery or it was a journey of remembering. And then two, here we are another two years later and I just updated it to Ignite Magic Daily, basically talking about how can we live in flow, feel those synchronicities, those God winks, those mini miracles. And for me, that practice is really my spiritual practice, right? And that looks different day to day. I'm not someone who believes in having the exact structure every day to meditate, do breath work, whatever. 
I want to feel into the moment to utilize the tool that is going to serve me best in how I feel in that moment. So I'm curious from your point of view, what does your, what are a few of your top mindful and spiritual practices? Yeah. It's interesting. I think it all comes down to self-trust and I think it comes down to like, I, I talk to a lot of people that are like, man, I do my miracle morning for two hours a day and it doesn't do anything. And I'm like, how do you know that actually serves you? It works for you. How do you know what you actually need? Why don't you slow down that and start understanding how to trust yourself and then you can make decisions and then not second guess them every like six seconds when you're in them. So for me, I do the same thing. I, I, I started a practice of self-trust and understanding how to love, like, and trust myself. And that way I can make decisions that I know are right for me or serving of me in that moment. So um, I do wake up with a smile on my face and with gratitude every morning. Tell myself what I love about me, what I love about the, the day before, that I'm glad that I got another chance today. And these are the things that I'm going to do to make sure I take advantage of it and, you know, serve the world at a, at a higher level. So just waking up with a smile and, and immediately getting into a gratitude practice is what I do every single day because I know that serves me regardless. Then there's breath work and there's meditation. And some days I'll just, I'll just go off for like an hour long walk. I just, I like that, you know, and I'll do a hike or I'll just sit and I'll just put on some meditation music and I'll just, like I live up on top of a mountain in LA. So I just watch the sunrise over the mountain and I just sit there and just have some mindful, you know, just present moment practice. There's some days where I really work out hard. There's some days I swim. I trust myself enough to know what serves me best. And so like this phase of my life right now, as I'm, as I'm making all these changes and, and transitioning and I'm, I'm tightening the message and I'm like really putting myself out there. I mean, for those of you that listened to the episode that my wife and I cut, episode 302, like it's raw. Like I'm telling my wife how afraid I was to love her fully. And she's sitting there eye to eye. And there's a microphone on and it's live in our, in our Facebook community with 1200 people watching, you know, like not all those were watching, but still I, I, I need to take care of me. I can't be in the gym pounding the weights because my body, my mind, my calorie burn, it's, it's, it's intense right now as I'm going through this transition. So I just take care of myself in the morning. I, I, I talk to myself nicely. I talk to my wife about things that I'm like experiencing or fears that I have. Um, I'm, I'll go for a walk. I do stretching. I just lay with my kids. Like this morning, I lay with my kids till like seven o'clock on the couch. They slept with me on the couch. We all just fell asleep together. And I just sat with them because I said, you know what? I will never get this moment back with these two kids laying like this in, in, at this age with this sunrise coming in the window. I'll never get this back. And I'm just going to stay right here because that's where I feel like I belong right now in this moment. So honestly, dude, it goes down to self-trust. When you trust yourself, you know exactly what to do for yourself at every moment. Now, it doesn't mean like you know every business move to make and you're going to become a billionaire tomorrow. It just means you know how to operate you inside of situations, which is powerful. Yeah, Ian, yeah. that is awesome. I resonate with that so much. And I think that's where people get caught trying to do all the things and approach spirituality as a doing list as opposed to being less. So yeah. thank you for echoing that and providing your own twist. This has been awesome, guys. Make sure you connect with Ian. He, all the links to connect with him are in the show notes. Check that out. His podcast, Now That You're Placeable Man, and so much more. Ian, thank you so much, brother, for coming on the pod. Of course, man. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Absolutely.